for us to be here once again with you, and uh, it will be, I guess it will be a year ago, so if you can remember a year ago, it will be a year ago September, uh, we were on our way and had some meetings set up, and so we stopped by here on a Wednesday, and and I got to meet some of you, but uh, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. And uh, my name is Daniel Burdine, and uh, my wife Janet down here, my lovely wife, the beautiful one on the front up here. And uh, we've been married 25, be 25 years in December. Uh, glorious years. We're grateful for and thank the Lord for her. And uh, glad that we could uh, be together today uh, with you. Uh, we do have three children, just to kind of give you a little background of who we are. Um, we have three children. They are um, out, of, out of our home. They're, we're empty nests, I guess you'd say, uh, semi. Our youngest has been with us this summer. He'll go back to school and graduate this, uh, this year. But uh, we have uh, Valerie. She's 23. She's our oldest. And she's a Christian school teacher in Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, also teaches in a, a college, Indiana Baptist College. And uh, Nathaniel, our middle son's 22. And uh, God just gave him opportunity, which we're grateful for. He was able to plant a church, uh, start a church in Pennsylvania uh, back in May. And uh, so the Lord has really blessed him. We were part of that church plant, uh, helping him get started and uh, been with him throughout the, the summer different times. And God has given us opportunity for that. And so the Lord's blessing him and using him. Uh, God's given him so much and blessed him so much. He just needs a wife, so pray that God will give him a wife uh, very soon. Any prospects today, you let me know. Come see us, and we'll, uh, we'll vet you, and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, then Nicholas, our uh, youngest, will graduate from Pensacola uh, Christian this fall. So uh, thank the Lord for our kids. He's, tw he's 20. But uh, no, we don't look old enough to have kids that old. Everybody always says that. Maybe I'm being presumptuous by saying that. But we were married when we were 14. And uh, so now they may do that in Tennessee. They don't do that in Ohio, okay? So anyway, but, uh, but thank the Lord for what he's given us. We're grateful. And, uh, but we've, we've enjoyed our time together. We've been on deputation now for, uh, it was a year uh, in May uh, for us. We finished up and we've had just some several, couple, couple meetings, two meetings I think this summer. Uh, that God has given us, but uh, we've been using this summer just to get things ready and prepared. Um, Lord willing, which we ask you to pray for this, but we'll be leaving uh, for Nicaragua uh, the end, the last week of September. And so do pray for us as we get things ready. And that's what we kind of we've used uh, the summer for, of getting things prepared and everything at our house and uh, getting things in order to leave. So uh, do pray for us that we can get everything together and uh, health and everything coming together as we trust the Lord uh, to do that. And so we covet your prayers with that. And uh, so we've spent a year together traveling. It's been great. And uh, God's blessed us. We uh, committed that to the Lord. We asked God to do that. We, uh, so we, wherever we are in a year um, of deputation, we're going to go to the field by God's grace. And uh, God has brought us to the point where we're just right, almost right where we need to be. And uh, the Lord has provided abundantly, and uh, we're grateful. And so we're, uh, Lord willing, uh, on our way. So do, do pray for us with that. If you turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke this morning, uh, tonight, looking forward to tonight, being with you once again, we'll show a uh, video, uh, it's a updated video with all new pictures, and it's from a uh, trip uh, that we just took to Nicaragua uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so the middle of, toward the end of July, we took a trip, my wife and I, and our, our daughter got to go with us, Valerie. She got to spend that time with us and see the work and see what uh, God has called us to. And so, so it was a special time, but uh, it was a very productive trip, very fruitful trip. God used it. We wanted to take some time to go and just kind of lay some groundwork for when we get there in September. And uh, the Lord used it mightily and uh, we were able to get in the country, get out of the country, and uh, passed all of our COVID tests, praise the Lord. And uh, we, we did three, had to do, ended up doing three COVID tests. Uh, the first one we did wasn't the right one. And uh, to get out of the States, to get into Nicaragua, and so you have to have it in a certain time frame. And finally got the correct one and got it into the right time. 
And uh, then we had to take one before we left Nicaragua as well. So uh, if you're concerned, if you're worried, uh, we've been tested three times and all three times were negative. And uh, we studied all night for those tests. And boy, it was worth it, I tell you. But anyway, uh, we, we, we're, we're clean and we praise the Lord for that. But uh, we thank the Lord for uh, this getting us in and everything working out as it did. And so things are open. You can travel. You can go. Uh, you can go places. It's, it's, it's all available. Just got to go through a few little hoops here and there. And, uh, but God gives grace and God sees you through, which we're thankful for it. Luke chapter 24, we'll read together uh, from the scriptures this morning, uh, the end of the chapter, and I would like to begin our reading uh, in verse 44, and this month, of course, for your church is Missions Month, and we're um, delighted to be, be able to be a part of that and be with you during this time, and uh, it's a very special time, and I would like to say this, in spite of everything um, going on in our, our own country, and for that matter, around the world and uh, things that are taking place and uncertainties and all the things that the concerns that are uh, about us. Um, I do want to state this, and as may have already has been stated uh, during this month and maybe all will before the month's out, um, the Great Commission never stops. Never stops. Um, God never gave a clause in the scripture and gave an exception uh, if something happens or if this happens, that um, then it can pause for a moment. Uh, the Great Commission never pauses. It's a command that Christ gave. It's a commission that he gave uh, that must continue. And understand this, the Great Commission was something that was used mightily and it spread as a result of persecution. And we find that in the, in the book of Acts. And uh, God had to send persecution in order for the church to scatter and uh, churches to be planted and to go to the regions beyond uh, Jerusalem and the Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world uh, that the gospel could be spread and God sent persecution to accomplish that and, uh, and it worked and it, God used it in a mighty way and, uh, and so uh, the Great Commission never stops. Uh, even with all of the, uh, the fears of, the, of traveling and the fears of the borders and all that takes place, um, it's possible. And we have to trust the Lord with that. And uh, the work of God must continue. And so Jesus, as we find in the latter part of Luke 24, as he did in Matthew and Mark, he gave to us what we consider what we call uh, the Great Commission. And by that meaning, the commission that we are sent forth and uh, we have this mission that we've been given to spread and to proclaim uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what the gospel is. Uh, the gospel is good news. And as we have this good news, it's the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, the gospel which we find defined in, uh, in uh, Corinthians, in the latter part of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, which defines it as the death the burial and the resurrection. That's how we often use it. What is the gospel? It's in three phases, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is because that's the good news of Christ. I'm thankful that Jesus died for me, amen? And he shed his blood for me. And because of that, I have forgiveness of sins. I have atonement. I'm redeemed. Uh, what love that is, what grace that is to us because of what Jesus did. The wrath of God that I deserved Jesus took for me and, uh, and sacrificed himself for me. He was buried. Uh, I'm glad that as he was buried in all of this, because we're saved this morning, we are identified in this with Christ. We're crucified with him. We are buried with him. I'm glad the old man is dead, amen? I'm glad my sin no longer has dominion. And uh, we are buried with him. And uh, then that third day, the stone was rolled away. And a new life, new beginning, new hope. And uh, we are risen with Christ and uh, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's good news today. And that's what's changed my life. And I hope this morning that you can say that that's what's changed your life. Uh, your life is different now because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's transforming uh, in our life. And so that good news needs to be spread uh, to your family. That good news needs to be spread to your neighborhood. That good news needs to be spread all over Johnson City, all over this area of Tennessee. Not only here, your state, 
our country, this nation, but around the world, that good news needs to travel. We have enough fake news, don't we? We need good news, and that good news is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let's read the scriptures together as Jesus gives this, uh, as Luke gives us this account. Verse 44, the scripture says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. As Jesus gives us these words as... Again, we consider this the great commission that is given to us. We find Matthew gave it at the end, and, and Mark uh, gave us his account of Jesus giving the great commission. Now Luke gives us the account of the commission of Christ. We find it one other time uh, in Acts 1.8 as Jesus ascended uh, into heaven. And that last one time, and he shall be witnesses unto me, uh, after, that, after that the Holy Spirit of God has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the world. But I want you to look at the scripture in verse 47 at the latter part, and this is what Jesus said. And we have really defined for us as Jesus gives to us the gospel uh, here in verse 46. As he says, Jesus suffered. That's his death. That's the cross. That's him our, being our substitute for us. And to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance, and here's the message, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. The gospel changes lives. And the fact is, no matter where you live in this world today, there's one thing that, as we see in our world today, it's connected more than it ever has been before. But there's one thing that is a common thread of all of human, humankind, every human being, and that is we're sinners. And we need salvation. Whether it's Nicaragua, whether it's Africa, whether it's Asia, no matter where it's at, the gospel must be preached. Because all men are sinners and all men need to be saved. There's not just a select few, there's not a chosen few. All men need to be saved. And the scripture says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I believe that. I believe that truly, that all men need to be saved and all men need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus gave here basically the gospel to us, then he says this, it should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And I'd like to just for just a moment that we have to think of this, where and is this just this thought? Where do we begin with this? Well, that's a daunting task if you think about it, Jesus gave. He said that this gospel, this message of hope, of repentance and remission should be preached in his name among all nations. All nations. But then he adds this, beginning. Here's where you begin. Yes, it's a daunting task, but here's where you begin with it. Clarence Sexton says this many, many times. He says, nothing becomes personal unless it becomes specific. Nothing becomes personal unless it becomes specific. So for us this morning, let's just make the gospel of Jesus Christ, let's get specific with it, and let's talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that by God's grace and through him and his, through his word, and as Jesus said clearly here with his disciples, and I love this expression, and may he do it for each of us, and may he do it for you and I during this month uh, regarding missions, and that is in verse, um, uh, verse, uh, four, verse 44, 
speaking that he explained the scriptures to them beginning with Moses and and went through the scriptures the prophets and the Psalms and he talked about himself but then he says in verse 45 then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures oh may God open the word of God up to us that it can become personal to us and our eyes would be open to understand this gospel yes it has changed my life but you know what it's personal to me and if it's something that's personal to you it will become a personal responsibility that is my responsibility to proclaim the gospel not just the churches we often people go to church and and uh, they're a member of a local independent baptist church and they're on the roll and got that all taken care of join baptize all that's taken care of and and often we'll say yes my church is involved in missions my church is involved in faith promise and boy we got a missions month going on and and uh, boy we're hoping to get the faith promise up we can get more missionaries all that takes place during this month but i'm going to ask you this question what are you doing what are you doing it must be personal. If Buffalo Ridge Baptist is going to truly make an impact around the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it must become personal to you. If it is personal to you, then there's a few things that's going to show up in your life. You're going to be telling people about Jesus Christ. You're going to be sharing the gospel with those of of those that work with you. You're going to be sharing the gospel with those in your neighborhood. You're going to be able to be a part of a local effort through your church and, and soul winning and reaching boys and girls for Jesus Christ, reaching these neighborhoods for Jesus Christ. You're going to be a part of and very eager about taking a faith promise card and, and putting your name on that and praying, God, what do you want me to do? Not, not if you want me to do anything. It's already a given. God wants you to do something. It's just what is God leading you to do, how much? And letting God speak to you and letting God lead you and, and letting God do a work of faith in your life. Remember, it's faith promise. And so it's an act of faith and trusting God to provide the need for you. And let me tell you, you will always say, God does not work on terms of logic like we do. Okay? We think, try to think logically. Just you got it when it comes to the work of God, you got to throw that out because that's not the way that God works. Now, logically, if you go back to the Old Testament and the children of Israel are now going into the conquest through their new leader, Joshua, and God says, You're going to take Jericho, and God has already given that promise to, uh, to Joshua, and uh, Joshua's given it to the people. God's given us this land, Jericho awaits, and man, God's, God's given this to us. And Joshua can't wait. He wanted to go into Kadesh Barnea, he and Caleb, but because of the 10 other uh, false report, uh, they weren't able to go in. And so this is the time. But before, the, before Jericho, there's a Jordan River. Now, did God forget about that? Oh, yeah, Jericho. Yeah, you're supposed to go to Jericho, but I forgot about the Jordan. How could I let that get by me? No, that, that's, that's how we think logic. Yeah, I know God said Jericho, but my goodness, there's Jordan there. And not only is it Jordan, but it's harvest and it's overflowing its banks. Now what? Remember, God does not, in his act of faith and his leading of faith, does not always go with our logic. God had a plan. He wanted to prove. He wanted to prove to them. He wanted them to show their faith and how they would respond to the Lord. And so Joshua set them all up and the ark and the priests and the people in order in line. And he says, when the soles of the feet of the priests touch the water, then I'm going to part it. And let me tell you something, God kept his word. And as soon as the soles of the feet of those priests touched the brim of the water, I think if I was a priest, I would probably say, listen, why can't you just do what Moses did and just get a stick and hold it out over the water and, and say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and see the waters part? Why can't we do it that way? Why do we have to get our feet wet? Why does that have to be part of this whole thing? I don't know about you, but I don't like to get my feet wet, especially with shoes on. You know, take my shoes off, roll my pant legs up or whatever. I'm okay with that, but shoes on, socks on, getting your feet wet and I, I just don't like the just slopping around everywhere and water squirting out the top of your shoes. There's no fun in that. 
But God says, I want your feet to touch the water. And as soon as they did, God kept his word and the waters parted. Listen, there's some times in your life you're gonna have to step out in faith. You say, God, I don't know how you're gonna do it. But I wanna tell you something. God keeps his word and God keeps his promises and God's word is true. You can trust the Lord. You can trust him. We've seen that in our life, my wife and I, the last year and a half, going back even two years and, and seeing God work through this whole journey of where we are today. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you if, you, if you go back a year and a half and, and look forward to this and saying, okay, and, to, and, that, and that thought, okay, we're, we're going, we're gonna get there and it's time to move, it's time to uh, make these plans. It was an impossible thing. It truly was. And it was a mountain I thought, how in the world is all this gonna happen? But listen, we can sit all day praying about something and that's good to pray. We can sit all day thinking about something, but until you move forward, God begins to work. And when you put your feet in that water, God will work. You can pray all day about faith promise, but until you put something down, is only then you're gonna begin to see God work in your life. And you commit and say, God, I'm gonna do this for you. I believe this is what you're leading me to do. I'm gonna trust you for it. Don't know how you may all do it, but I'm gonna trust you to provide this need. Let me tell you, God keeps his word. Nothing becomes personal unless it becomes specific. And may the great commission, may the gospel become personal to you. Where does all this begin in our life? And as he says in verse 47, at beginning, beginning at Jerusalem, it begins right where you are today through your church your community faith promise your workplace may it begin there in your life I believe as we look at Jesus I believe he wanted to prepare these disciples and let's look at where Christ began with them he began with them number one in verse 44 with the scriptures the scriptures he took them to the word and he began to explain to them as in verse 45, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. But in verse 44, as it says there, he says, while I was yet with you, that I, I spoke of these things, he says, that all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now that's all that Luke records for us here, but if you go back in Luke 24, you find that as Jesus walked with the two on the road to Emmaus, he just talked with them and, and he expounded the scriptures to them. He went back from again like he did with the disciples. Here Luke just gives us a short verse saying this is what Jesus did and as he spoke. But boy, what a, what a Sunday school lesson that would have been to hear te Jesus teaching about himself all the way from Moses to the prophets to the Psalms concerning himself. Wouldn't that be a great thing to hear? My goodness, that'd be such a lesson to take in. And the disciples are listening to this and the Bible says here, which God can do for every single one of us today, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And unless the word of God has impact in our life, and I believe there's two things that the word of God teaches us and I think they're, they're, they're profound truths that if these do not impact our life, nothing will, nothing will. And that is number one what the scripture says and Jesus reminded him in verse 46 that it behooved Christ to suffer but then this here and to rise from the dead the third day. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that Jesus is risen today? He's risen? Now think about this. <coughs> the disciples from this time as Jesus is speaking with them, okay? So you go back four days, just four days prior to this, the disciples are just all over the place. They're emotionally erect, they're, uh, they're, they're mentally, they're just, they're all over the place. But then you find from this point, go, or going back, I'm going back after the, the, uh, the ascension, you have 40 days after the resurrection, 40 days, Jesus coming and going. And then from that point, 10 days to Pentecost. So you have from the resurrection, the, what Jesus did through the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
to Pentecost, which is 50 days. Now you look at Peter's life, you look at the others, you look at Thomas, you look at the others that were part of this that did not believe when the women came and said, Jesus risen, they didn't believe what she, what she said. But then you fast forward this, 50 days, you find Peter standing and preaching. You find him proclaiming, 3,000 souls come to Christ. A few chapters later in Acts, he's preaching again, 5,000 souls come to Christ. You find these disciples completely transformed. What changed them? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, a risen Savior, the victory that came through the resurrection. And it was nothing that the disciples did. It was simply what Jesus had done for them. And it had completely transformed their life. Think about that. 50-day transformation. I'm on board with that one, aren't you? 50 days? Well, listen, this morning we can experience and we know that the resurrection is what changed our life. The power lies within every single one of us. If we've been saved, we've trusted Christ. The resurrection changed everything. We truly serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you a story. It's not a real true story, but a guy and his wife, they wanted to go to the Holy Land, wanted to go to Jerusalem. And uh, they talked about it for a long time, planned a long time. Finally, that day came. Men, they got everything ready, got their passports, tickets. They had it all ready to go and got to the airport and, and uh, got on the, getting on the plane. Everything was just going well. And then the wife, she just started complaining about things. Things just didn't go very well on the flight and the connections and getting there. And boy, she just started nagging and complaining. And again, I have nothing against women. Please understand that, ladies, okay? This is just a story, okay? Nothing personal this morning. So she just complained and complained and complained and complained. And they got there, got to the hotel. She complained about the hotel. She complained about everything that was there, just all the accommodations, everything. Just complain, 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 complain. Uh, the the, the uh, tourist guide, all of that. And the guy was really getting really fed up about it. And, and uh, eventually, she got so worked up, uh, she had a heart attack and she died in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem. And so he too took her to the undertaker and, and uh, undertaker kind of sat down and explained some things to him. And he just simply said, he said, okay, here's the deal. He said, we can keep her here and we can have a beautiful, beautiful funeral, flower. I mean, it is a beautiful Jerusalem funeral and for $500, that's all it'll be. But if you send her back home, uh, that'll be $5,000. So it's up to you, whatever you want to do. So the guy Thought about it for a little bit, and he said, well, listen, he said, let's just, uh, let's just send her back home. And Undertaker said, okay, that's, that's fine, it's your choice. But he said, uh, he said can I just ask what you, you know, why? You're going to spend $5,000, or you could only spend five hundred. keep her here, and beautiful funeral, and everything will be wonderful here. And, and he said, well, he said, it's like this. He said, I, I said, I guess I've heard this story. It happened a long, 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 long time ago. About this guy that lived in Jerusalem, he died, and three days later, he rose again. And we're just not really going to take that chance. <laughs> so that's a, that's a really morbid story, isn't it? <laughs> With that being said, the resurrection is a reality. Jesus has risen, has changed everything. And not only do that, again, this is what we learn from scriptures that transform our lives, and then... Secondly, what we learn from scriptures is Jesus is coming again. Amen. He's coming again. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight, about the return of Jesus Christ. But it's a reminder as you think of missions, I, I truly believe, and again, I know we've said it year after year after year, from the time I was a child, my dad preached and said the very same thing. We're living in the last days. And, I, and I, I believe we can say that even Paul said that. But these days we're living in are truly unique days. We've never seen the world connected as we have today. The, the similarities, what you identify with worldwide, we've, we've never seen it. And uh, the coming of Christ could happen today 
and tomorrow, tonight, everything we read in Revelation, everything we read of the end time could all happen like that. It could all set up in a moment, in a moment. And with that thought and the reality of the return of Christ, let, let, let the Holy Spirit of God through his word open your understanding to this and be reminded of this. We don't have much time. We, we're, this is urgent. It's urgent to get the gospel around the world. We were just in Nicaragua and there are still millions of people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were there with a medical team and, and uh, that was there while we were there and they had arrived a little bit before us but uh, they were about 30 of them were able to go and nurses and a couple doctors and some other just helpers that were trained to be a part of that mission team and, and uh, just a great, great ministry and, and God used them there for a few days and they were able to, in the mountain region of Nicaragua, Matagapa, they were able to um, treat over 1,100 uh, people all over the mountain, the community, just people just flocked in every day, lines of people wanting to be treated for eyes or health or COVID or whatever uh, ailment they had, they were there to be treated, to be helped, to be seen. And, but through that, 135 of them trusted Jesus as Savior. And after they were treated, they were taken to a booth and sat down and one-on-one -on -one were able to hear the gospel and have the gospel of Jesus Christ explained to them. So much more of that needs to be done. And it needs to be done over and over and over and over again because time is short. And over 900 of them went back to their places, maybe not having received Christ, that need another team coming in. That whole thing needs to be repeated, not only in Nicaragua, but around the world. Around the world. This gospel must be preached. And may God help us to not let anything slow us down in the process. And to let the things of the elements of this world halt us in doing what Jesus has commanded us to do and never gave us a stopping point. May the scriptures impact us. And Jesus gave the word of God to them, gave them the scriptures and the word concerning himself. Secondly, the thing to remind us and to, we must remember, and this is where it gets personal, that we are sent. We are sent. And if you look in verse uh, 48, Jesus reminded them of this. And he says in verse 48, ye are witnesses of these things. Th this is where the impact is. You're not just talking about some, something that's helped somebody else. You're not talking about some, something that's kind of third person. No, you're witnesses of it. He took, looks at his disciples, you, you, you've seen my life, you, you saw me suffer, you saw, you, here I am, evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at my hands, look at my side, look at my feet. You see everything, you're witnesses of what has happened, not only what you see, but what it is doing in your life, what your life has been changed through this. Listen, you're witnesses of this. As I have been sent from the Father, so send I you. You're sent. That's when it becomes personal to us. When we see from scriptures, hey, we have a risen Savior. The scriptures teach us he's coming again. This gospel's changed my life. Therefore, I am witnesses of this. And according to the scripture, I am sent. Not just Pastor Herdman, you're sent. Not just us, you're sent. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you do, say amen. Amen. If you know Jesus Christ and the gospel's changed you, you're sent. Sorry, but you're sent. You're sent wherever you are. You're sent because of the gospel. And then thirdly and lastly, and I love this, verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from one high. We have the Spirit of God. As Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. How can he say he's with us? He ascended. He's on the right hand of the Father because he sent us the Holy Spirit of God. And we have that promise of the Spirit of God that now lives and indwells every single one of us that are saved. 
And the presence of God is continually with us. But not only his presence is with us, but his power flows through us. And the power of the Spirit wants to work in our life and to do the work that we cannot do. I cannot be sent forth. Say, okay, I'm sent, here I go. No, I need the power of the Spirit. I need the work of the Spirit to flow through my life to accomplish what only He can accomplish. And that word endued just simply means to be sinking into a garment. Yes, the Holy Spirit of God is in me, but I'm thankful He just surrounds me. He surrounds you. He's all over you today. Sometimes we live so independently and forget the Spirit of God's presence is here. Every moment, every need, he's there. Every task, he's there. And I must rely on him. And you must rely on him. May I encourage you, may I challenge you? It just takes one. It just takes one. Will you be that witness? One. And will you tell that other person? Just one. We never know what can begin through that. My, and I close with this. My... Um, Wife's family is a great example of this. She um, grew up in a, her dad was a drunk and gambler and did not grow up in a Christian home. And, um, but her one brother, Brother Jing, who is a pastor now in the Philippines and um, Christian school, Bible college, orphanages of over, orphanage of over 100 and some kids. And uh, church has been planted through that ministry. It's an amazing work that God has done. But it all started one day when just one person told Brother Jing about Jesus Christ. My wife comes from a family of 14 siblings. It's a big family. She's the second to the youngest. And so I'm always grateful her parents never stopped. They just kept producing until she came to her. So I'm grateful for that. And, but the Lord used that one person to witness to Brother Jing. As a result of that, Jing began telling his family about Christ her mom and dad eventually trusted Jesus as their savior. Her siblings have now trusted Jesus Christ as their savior. And her sister, oldest sister, uh, 66 years old, the day after we arrived in Nicaragua just a few weeks ago, uh, she got notification that her oldest sister was 66, good, you know, was fine up to that point, had a massive heart attack, and the Lord took her. And because of COVID all week, she couldn't go home, and just, it, it was difficult. But just three years ago, um, Sister Pang trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And as you look at that, her whole family, all those siblings, mom and dad, all Catholic, but because one person told another person about Jesus Christ, changed the whole family. Changed the whole family. And that spread of the gospel, now with what the Jing, Jing has done in the Philippines is amazing. It is spread now here through our family. Our son is in Pennsylvania starting a church. Souls are being saved. It, it's a multiplication that just continues and continues and continues. And it never ends. But it began with just one person. Let it begin with you today. Take it personally. Please, let it become personal to you. Father, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for your word. Help us to, God, just let it become personal. May it impact us. Thank you for our Savior. Thank you for Jesus. May we spread the good news. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, what a joy to hear, Brother Dan. Thank you so much, Brother, for being here with us today. And uh, this combined class, I hope you've enjoyed that. And then this evening, we look forward to hearing him preach. And then we'll see some updates about his ministry. I'm excited about our church coming alongside of the Verdine family. And I want you to get to know them a little bit more as we go forward in this, uh, this having them here with us today. So with that being said, you're dismissed. We've got about 15 minutes. If you need to slip uh, to the restroom or adjust your seating. And uh, then the main service will start right here at 11 o'clock. God bless you. Mm -hmm.